morning, everyone. Welcome to the Windward Academy webinar to not get lost in the pile. I'm Dr. Jennifer Windward. I'm the founder and CEO of Windward Academy, and I'm really excited to be with you this morning to take you through how to avoid the most frequent college application mistakes. So we'll go ahead and jump right in and get started. All right, so the first thing I'd like to do today is just give a little shout out to Zoom, who's been a great partner for us here at Windward Academy to help get our webinar messages and our educational resources out to a wider audience. So first, just wanted to thank Zoom again for its sponsorship and its support. Next, what I'd like to do is take you through the agenda for today. So kind of the main focus of the presentation is to first go through what are just general tips for the college application process. Then I wanna go through kind of the different stages of an essay. So what do you do before you start writing? How do you figure out what to write about? And then how do you know when you're actually ready to click that submit button? Right? There is so much work that goes into pulling together the college application that there's always that extra bit of anxiety before you actually feel like I'm ready, I'm going to click submit, here we go. So again, I just want to lay out some great um, tips to follow to make sure that students are feeling really comfortable throughout the process as they're preparing, as they're going through their apps, and then also as they're submitting. Now, before we begin the main presentation, of course, I just wanna spend about five minutes going through kind of some overview information about how COVID has affected the college application process. So the first thing I wanted to make sure that you all are aware of is that the common application, which is how most students will apply to college, right? Most students will apply to private schools and public schools that are on the common app. And they did actually add an additional optional essay that students can write in which they can address how did COVID impact their lives. Now this is a 250 word essay so I want to put into perspective for you that the main essay for the, for the Common App has not changed. Those seven prompts are the same prompts that they've been in years past. But they have given students this opportunity, if they want to, again, it's optional, to share a shorter essay, right? So the main one is 650 words. They are giving this shorter um, essay opportunity for students to also add, if they want to, how has COVID impacted their college application or impacted their lives? So what I wanna kind of start with is this idea that there's this extra optional part, but that the main application has stayed the same. So what I'm hoping students realize from that, right, is this emphasis that you are not defined by COVID, right? None of us is. And so as you're applying to college, really the main part here is still to celebrate you, to celebrate your voice, to celebrate your identity, your values, and then to kind of view this, you know, opportunity to talk about COVID as an extra optional thing, if it seems appropriate for you. So again, your six main 650 word essay, I'm gonna talk about this more later, should not be the story of how your life was changed by COVID. Remember that college admissions officers are people and they don't wanna read the same style of essay over and over and over again. So we are gonna talk more in a little bit about how specifically to identify some good ideas for what to share. But I do wanna open by saying, yes, the colleges are interested. If there is something you wanna share about the impact of COVID, you can. They've added this extra optional essay. Some other things to kind of think about with the impact of COVID. So number one, we also have to remember that this is not just a new experience for all of the students applying. It's also a new experience for admissions officers, right? So college admissions has been the same for the past 50 years. And now all of a sudden within this really short time frame, everything is being reinvented. So if you kind of step back from the process a little bit and think about it, Basically, college admissions officers are going to be able to assess students on their first two and a half years of high school, but then kind of the end of junior year and the beginning of senior year, which historically has been a huge emphasis for colleges to assess students, right? Those junior year grades, those first semester senior grades, the activities that you're doing as you're continuing to mature and explore who you are and what you care about and what makes you tick, right? All of that is kind of out the window now for colleges. So please do keep in mind too that 
Yes, this is a new experience for all of the students, for all of the parents, but it is also a new experience for the admissions officers as well. Now, as you know, previously talked about, we don't necessarily have the reliability of test scores for college admissions officers. They're not necessarily gonna have a super clear cut junior year GPA. So it is going to be harder for them to make decisions. And what I think they're gonna to have to do, of course, is to dig a little bit deeper into the essays that you write, the letters of recommendations that you get, and then also the descriptions that you provide in your activity section. I think it's also very likely that colleges are going to need to look more closely at the interests that you display in their colleges, right? So a lot of schools have essays. Why do you want to come here? And historically, those essays have always been important to colleges because they want to feel like they're accepting people who have demonstrated genuine interest, who know about their college, who have perhaps visited their college, right? That visiting part isn't really possible right now. So perhaps you've explored virtual tours of a college, or perhaps you've you know, um, attended a webinar that the university you're interested in has been facilitating during um, the school closures and during COVID. So it is going to be really important. Colleges are really going to be looking closely to see that you as an applicant are displaying genuine interest in their university. Again, I put stars around the word likely because I'm just kind of estimating here, but it's also very likely that colleges are going to lean more on early decision applications. It's also possible that maybe from those early decision pools, they'll be more likely to defer students so that they can see their first semester senior year grades. So again, we're postulating here because there are a lot of unknowns, but my goal is just kind of throw out all of the, it could be this, it could be this, just so that we're all on the same page with what to expect. Um, how do we interpret these new ACT and SAT requirements and how these exams have now been optional, right? These colleges did not have a choice with cancellations starting in March and continuing throughout all of the spring exams. The fall exams, we still have a question mark on, right? The very first SAT of the fall uh, quarter is next weekend and we'll have to see what happens, how many are canceled, rescheduled, or if they proceed as planned. So the colleges did not have a choice. They had to make the ACT and SAT requirements optional because they can't pe penalize students if they just can't take the test. So when you take a step back, right, parents are asking me all the time, should I still have my seniors take this? Should we still push, right? Because there are a lot of students who studied throughout junior year. They felt ready to go in March or ready to go in April. And it's been really disappointing for them to you know, feel ready to perform and, and to do really well and then to not have that opportunity excuse me, to not have that opportunity. So kind of the main way to view this is number one, if you don't have test scores, that can't hurt you, right? The colleges can't punish you unnecessarily if you weren't able to take the test because it wasn't available in your area, because it was canceled, et cetera. That being said, if you do have test scores, that's just something that will help you in the process, right? So not having them is not gonna hurt you, but I do have parents who said, gosh, you know, my junior took this test in December or in February and did really well. Should I still submit those scores, right? So there are parents um, unsure of how to guide their kids with that. And the answer is, of course, still submit the scores, right? If it's something that is, you know, really celebratory and makes your application competitive, of course you want to include it. Another thing that's kind of interesting about COVID, and this is something I actually view as a good thing that will hopefully come about from COVID, is that there's been a movement in the past about 10 years or so. It was actually started at Harvard. It's a project that's called Making Caring Common. And it's this movement among some of the most competitive schools in our country that are trying to focus more on character when you accept students to college. So focusing more on life skills, on kindness, on non-cognitive skills, on grit, right? How do we better judge character when we're accepting people to our colleges? And so there's been this big push for the past 10 years or so to have kind of this character movement. And I do think that in some way, the colleges are gonna be forced to do a bit more of this in this next application cycle because they won't have some of those numbers that they tend to rely so heavily on. 
One thing too that colleges are also going to do is they're going to be adding more interviews. So you will kind of find that as you're applying, you might hear that there are more schools opening up opportunities to do Zoom conference interviews with students um, to then meet with alumni. Again, the goal there is just trying to get a better sense of who you are and how you'll contribute to the university, how you'll grow in your college experience, what you're passionate about, right? So having an opportunity to do those interviews would be great, especially if you can really demonstrate genuine interest in a school and also showcase what a great person you are. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of the competitiveness, right, people ask the question all the time, you know, are applications for this year going to be more competitive or they're going to be less competitive, right? This is something that is a big stress point for a lot of families. So I want to mention that we don't know the answer, right? Nobody knows the answer. It's not going to be until April of 2021 that we even know what this upcoming college admissions landscape result really is. So it is possible that students are going to submit fewer applications. Perhaps if they can't visit colleges or they can't feel a real connection to a college, they might not apply. Perhaps there are families facing additional financial constraints and so they're not going to be able to afford to apply or perhaps they're concerned that they won't be able to afford the tuition if they're accepted. It's also possible that we'll have fewer international students apply, which does have a benefit for American students. So if any of our international students are on this call, apologies for this comment, but it is true that international students tend to be incredibly competitive in American uh, college admissions. So if we have fewer international students applying, there is that idea then that it would be less competitive for American students. Um, it's also possible that the opposite is going to happen, right? That more students might apply to college because they want to hedge their bets and they figure, hey, I'm going to go for it, right? We have no idea what to expect. Maybe even there are students whose ac academic profile might make them a little bit less competitive for college, where in the past maybe they wouldn't try. Now they're going to decide to try because, hey, why not? And maybe the colleges will do a deeper assessment of who I am in my application and then end up admitting me. But remember, no one really knows, and we're not going to really see the impact of this until April. Okay, so that was my COVID spiel. I did want to at least address, you know, the elephant in the room that COVID is going to have an impact on college admissions. Um, so hopefully that, that overview just helps kind of set the tone of now going into the meat of the presentation, which is how I really, really just want to focus on how to showcase, how to shine, in a college application. So I'm gonna go through three tips in each of these categories and we'll go ahead and start with general tips for the college application process. So the first thing I wanna do, this might sound a little bit silly, but I tell all my students to do this, is I want you to pretend that you are an admissions officer. So pretend that you've created Jennifer University or Windward University, right? Ask yourself, what would you look for in a student? So do you think that you would want to admit someone who seems like a total know-it-all? Or do you think you'd want to admit someone who seems eager to learn and eager to contribute? Do you think you would want to admit someone who seems to have a very rigid set of viewpoints? Or do you think you would want to admit someone who might be very passionate about issues, but is also really open to other perspectives? Do you think that you would want to review an application for someone who's applying to your university? And do you think you would connect with someone who looks like he or she just kind of pulled it together last minute, didn't really put in a lot of effort? Or do you think that you would feel more drawn to someone who put in the time to understand your university, to understand your university's values, and who, someone who really defined how he or she, she's him, himself or herself supporting the mission of your university, right? So hopefully in each of these scenarios, you responded with the second option, right? Think about the type of person you would want to admit to your university, and then make sure that when you're applying, you're kind of having that viewpoint so that when you're presenting who you are and what you care about and what you've done and how you've contributed and how you've grown and how you've learned, how you've failed, how you've approached challenges, you want to talk about all of those situations that you've embraced, all of those experiences in a way that really showcases 
great values, great character, right? Going back to that character movement that Harvard started. How can we really showcase your character? And how can we do it in a way that will connect to the people deciding, do they want you at their university? So I think sometimes if you kind of put on the other hat, even if you think about going into a job interview, what do you think the person opposite the table is gonna to wanna to hear? Probably that you've done research about the company, that you know about its history, that you're aware of its recent press releases, that you know what the values are of the company, what the mission is, right? You've got to find a way to show and make those genuine connections. And it's not easy, right? Because you're doing it through paper. If you do have an opportunity for an interview, it does give you a little bit of an extra chance to showcase those elements. However, if you don't, then it is really important that in your essays, you're able to demonstrate these connections. And kind of a, a final note on this first tip is that remember that admissions officers are people. They are human beings. It's not a machine. It's not a computer reading your application. It's a human. So naturally, they are going to care more when you care more. And when you can demonstrate in your application that you do care and that you have done research and that you do connect to the values of the university, it's only gonna showcase your application more and it's gonna make the person reading your application just feel more comfortable and feel more confident that you would be a great person to come to their school. Next tip is, and again, these are kind of our general tips before you apply, is I want you to think of college as a two-way street. Right, so kind of a play on our, our 35th president's uh, famous quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. We did a little play on this with college, right? Ask not what your college can do for you, ask what you can do for your college, right? So it's absolutely true that you're gonna go to college, you're gonna gain a lot from that experience. You're gonna learn from the professors, you're gonna connect with the campus community, right? You are going to gain a lot. However, when you're thinking about college, I also want you to think about the two-way street, not just what the college is gonna do for you, but what are you gonna do for the college? You are gonna be a contributing member of the campus. You need to envision how do you see yourself being an active, engaged, involved, committed member of the campus community? How are you gonna to contribute to academics, to research, to leadership? How are you gonna take advantage of professional programs and then give back to professional programs? How are you gonna work at the campus? Are you gonna work in the library? Are you gonna work in the bookstore? Are you gonna work in a cafeteria on campus? Right? Think of ways that you are going to contribute to the campus. Right? Sometimes young people go into everything thinking with college, like, what am I going to get? What am I going to get? But I really want to challenge you to think about what are you going to give? What are you going to give? Because when you can clearly articulate in your college application how you appreciate what you'll gain from a college, but also what you're excited to contribute to a college, again, that's only going to help showcase your application. Next tip is to make sure that you start early, right? Polish takes time. Applications are very time consuming, right? It takes months to put together college applications, especially if you're trying to do it right. Of course, the part that takes the most amount of time is working on your essays, since a lot of students like to take months finessing and polishing and editing. Actually filling out the application takes you two hours, maybe three hours. But the time consuming part, of course, is the personal statement and the essays that you're writing. Again, because of all of these points that I've made so far, what I'm describing sounds straightforward, but it is not easy, right? It takes time and it takes careful thought to be able to really connect to a college when you apply. So keep in mind too, that if you're hoping to receive feedback from editors, you can't send an essay to an English teacher and expect that you're gonna get it back two hours later. So remember, you have to be respectful of other people's time in this process, because when people read an essay for you, that person is doing you a favor and helping you. So please just be aware of that and build out time. If your application is due November 1st, you should not send it to your English teacher on October 31st, right? So work backwards plan ahead just know how much time it takes to really polish your applications and then one thing too that i think is really really important for students to remember when you click apply or when you click submit on your application it is your name on that app 
So you have to make sure that you feel proud of what you have submitted. Have you honored yourself and your voice and your story? Sometimes when we get feedback from people on our essays, incorporating that feedback can sometimes affect the voice and the story of the, the student who's applying. So I really want to caution against that because I think that the best college essays are the ones that really showcase and honor a student's voice. What makes the student quirky, what makes the student tick, right? Those are things that really can shine on paper. So you do just have to remember that as you're asking for feedback, you know, receive it with an open mind. But at the end of the day, this is your essay, this is your application, and you need to feel great when you submit. Keeping in mind that this upcoming college application cycle is going to be very different and is going to have fewer opportunities for admissions officers to critique your possible ACT SAT, which in the past was required, a solid junior year GPA, which for a lot of schools, they're not going to be able to share with colleges. So for that reason, this essay really needs to be taken seriously. I even told students this before COVID. You know, you look at college applications, you're like, okay, I get it. You know, this is where the student's from. Here's the GPA. Here's the great test score. Here are other great test scores on subject tests. You kind of just feel like you're checking boxes, checking boxes as you're comparing students. And then the second you get to the essay, you're like, yes, I'm finally going to know who this person is. Like, I'm finally going to get a sense of the student's voice and what this student cares about. So you almost have to think that like the rest of the application, you're just kind of establishing that it's worthwhile for the admissions officer to read your essay. But then the second the admissions officer gets to your essay, it's really this exciting, refreshing moment of, I'm going to learn about this student. I'm going to hear her voice. That's exciting. But to be able to have an impact in that moment on the admissions officer who's now excited to read your essay, you have to invest the time to get it right. These essays have to be taken seriously. They cannot be thrown together last minute. You might revise your essay 17 times before you submit it because you really want to make sure that every single sentence is intentional, meaningful, building the story, and honoring you. And that is not an easy thing and it is not a quick thing. So remember, you really, really need to make sure that you start early. Anytime you rush, it is super obvious to the reader. So you do also want to kind of honor the reader to show, hey, I took this seriously, I took my time, and then of course the person will be more receptive. It's also challenging to do this, right? It's a new experience for students to have to write this honest and vulnerable story of who you are and what challenges have you overcome, et cetera. And it's also a challenge to do that in a way that you've avoided cliches. Right? Most students will jump to, oh, I'm going to write an essay about a, a time that I, you know, did volunteer work for two hours, and then I was really appreciative of what I had after that experience. Right? There's nothing super exciting or compelling about that story because, okay, you just did something for two hours. Like, that's great. That's wonderful that you helped for two hours, but that doesn't show a genuine ongoing commitment. And it's cliche in the sense that, Lots of students could write about that experience. Lots of students could write about, wow, this is what it meant to me when my sports team won a championship, right? Those stories, to be totally honest, are boring, right? Because they're cliche and they've heard them over and over and over again. And anybody could write that story and have it sound very similar. So the challenge, again, is figuring out what unique story can you tell that only you can tell. And to come up with those ideas and to polish that story and to really make sure that in the end you feel proud, again, it's challenging to push deep, but it does take time. All right, so those were our first three tips, general big picture. Now let's talk about what to do before you start writing. So remember that as you're going into this process of writing your essay, it's really, really important that you stay true to yourself. So the ultimate goal of this essay is to honor your voice, your values, and your story. When you pick something to write about that you actually care about genuinely, your unique voice will come through and just naturally your essay becomes more engaging, it becomes more memorable. 
I mentioned this before, tell a story that only you can tell. Give the reader this feeling that he met you. And again, what I'm saying is not easy. I'm just saying this is the ultimate goal. And to give you some examples, I've had uh, one student wrote an essay about how he perfected a recipe for a pickle. And he told this story about these experiments he was doing in his kitchen and how he figured out the best way to make a pickle. That might sound a little bit silly, a little bit quirky, but guess what? It was perfect for him. And then if you dig into the story, what do you learn about him? We well, learn that he's creative. You learn that he is interested in doing, you know, science experiments to figure things out. He does talk about interacting with the siblings and his parents. So even though it seems kind of silly, uh oh, I just got an internet connection is unstable warning. I hope that you all can can still hear me. If anything breaks up, just please send a note in the in the chat or the Q and A. Hopefully my, my internet will, will keep going for us. Um, <clears throat> so back to the story. It seems silly to give this example of how I perfected a pickle. However, again, we learned a lot about him in that story. So keep in mind, you just wanna stay true to yourself. And sometimes, uh oh, I'm getting messages in the chat. Let's make sure you guys can all hear me. Broke up for a while. Okay. Okay, now it's okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you everyone for letting me know. It sounds like I broke up, but now hopefully I'm back. All right, if you have any questions about what you missed, just you know, feel free to write those and, and I'll come back to it. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, so back to staying true to yourself. You wanna tell a story only you can tell and you wanna try to pull the reader into what you share to give the reader a sense that he met you. The other thing I want you to remember is that a lot of colleges actually have several different prompts uh oh, I got another chat. Does that mean I broke up again? Let me check. Only froze for 10 seconds. Okay, all right. Phew, thank you everyone for letting me know. Okay, so the other thing that I want you to think about is that several essays, or excuse me, several applications will give you an opportunity to write several additional essays, right? So for example, the UC application, they have eight different prompts and you get to choose four of those prompts. On the Common App, you've got your one big 650 word essay. But when you apply to specific colleges, a lot of times they have extra supplements of these extra shorter essays, sometimes also longer ones, that they want you to write when you apply. So you want to try to think about, you have all of these different opportunities to share little bits and pieces of who you are. So I want you to take a step back from that because you really want to give a holistic sense of who you are. So you have to think carefully about each prompt and what can each prompt do in terms of highlighting a piece of who you are? Because you wanna paint a consistent picture of who you are and what you care about. However, you can have these different opportunities to showcase that from different parts of your life. Also very important to maintain a genuine tone. So you have to trust yourself in this process. It's really important that you choose a topic that you're gonna be comfortable writing about. At the same time, keep in mind that you might choose to write about a topic that's difficult, that's emotional, that's controversial. So if you choose to write about those types of kind of more iffy or risky topics, that's fine as long as you do so in a way that you treat that topic with respect and maturity. This is incredibly important. Also, it might sound silly for me to give this tip, but I promise you I've read a lot of essays from students that did exactly this and we had to take a step back and kind of regroup on the message. A lot of times students can feel like they're being genuine or they're being authentic if in an essay they're complaining about a teacher or perhaps being um, ingracious about their school or about some sort of situation. Keep in mind, you do not ever, ever, ever want to come off as being unappreciative, lazy, cynical, rude, right? You can see all of those descriptors on the screen. The essay is not the, the time for you to come off in that way. Even if you might actually feel like it's all your teacher's fault and your teacher was horrible and you bear no responsibility for anything. Even if you feel that way, when you apply to college, that is not the essay that you should be writing. The essay that you should be writing should be maybe two sentences about an experience that was perhaps difficult in the classroom 
The rest of the time needs to be about you, how you learn from the experience, how you grew from the experience, how you will do things differently in the future, right? This is not the time to complain about your teachers or say that, you know, the one B on my transcript is all my teacher's fault. That is not going to help you when you're applying to college if that's the story that you're telling. So keep in mind that yes, you want to be genuine. You need to be true to yourself. You need to be true to what you believe in and your passions. However, you also need to keep in mind that the person evaluating you is going to look for a young person who is going to come to his or her campus and be respectful and be mature and not just whine and complain, but actually take responsibility for things and find ways to learn and grow. We've talked a lot today about how important it is that you can display genuine interests in a college. So for that reason, you need to build time to do this research, right? I can't tell you how many times I've had students go, oh, I wrote this great essay for why I wanna to go to USC. I'm gonna copy it, I'm gonna paste it into my why do I wanna to go to Michigan essay, and then I'm just gonna change USC to Michigan. There are a lot of things wrong with that approach. Number one, I have heard horror stories of students who did that copy paste forgot to change the name of the college. So they applied to University of Michigan talking about why they wanted to go to USC. I'm sure you can all imagine and you're probably shaking your heads like, ooh, you probably didn't get into Michigan. That is one reason why taking this approach is risky. The second reason why taking this approach is risky is because Michigan and USC are very different universities, right? You can't apply to both with the same message of why you wanna go. So it's really important that when you are asked to describe why do you want to go to a college, your answer has to be super specific. You need to know what are unique courses offered there? Who are professors there who do research that you're really interested in getting involved in? What are specific organizations, student organizations that exist where you could get involved? Or maybe organizations that don't exist that you would want to create. You have to put in the time to do this research so that when you're telling a university why you want to go there, it's super compelling, it's super honest, and it's super real. When you're trying to come up with what should I say in these moments, consider how a college is defining its own identity. Read its slogan, read its mission, read its history, understand the service projects they offer, the areas of expertise that they're really proud of, right? Look for ways that you fit in those different places. By the way, you should do this anyway for yourself, right? If you're applying to a college and you can't clearly articulate why you wanna go there, you probably shouldn't be applying, right? So really keep in mind that this process is something you should be doing anyway. However, it's also something you really, really, really need to do, especially in a very specific and genuine way if you're asked to write these extra essays on why you want to go. All right, next tips are about how to figure out what you should write about. This is always every student's kind of sticking point of, okay, I get it, Jennifer. I hear everything you're saying. But I don't know what to write about, right? How do I figure out what to write about? So this is something I recommend to all of my students, and I will tell you why. What you should do is record yourself talking, right? So back in the day when I first started helping students with this, we actually had a physical recorder with a tape where we would do this exercise. Of course, now you can use, you know, an iPhone or smartphone to just record. But the best way to kind of capture your voice and what you care about is to talk to someone close to you. Even if you have a teen who like snuggles up with a pet and talks to a pet, I don't care. Talk to someone, talk to your pet, and just start opening up. What are moments of growth in your life? What are moments of challenge? What are moments of reflection? Because what happens is if you start talking about those things and you've recorded yourself, you can then play back what you have said and listen because your voice will change when you are talking about moments of vulnerability, passion, and authenticity. If you're doing this in person with someone, you're still recording yourself, but if you're doing it by talking to someone, it's almost like your face changes or your eyes light up. Like you change physically when you are talking about things about which you genuinely care. Then what you can do 
Because again, for a lot of students, they have these ideas in their heads, but then they don't know how to get them down on paper. So the other benefit of this trick of recording yourself is that then if you say something that's beautiful and compelling and real and you love it, instead of having that moment of, ooh, I just said something really good. What did I say? And then trying to write it down. You don't have to stress about that because you've recorded it. So you can just play it back to yourself and then type verbatim what you said. So it's a great way, A, to try to recognize what are things I talk about when I change how I sound and what I look like? Because those are the things you should be writing about in your college essay. So that's number one. Number two, you get this added bonus of, hey, I was talking for a while about things I like and I really liked what I said. I'm going to now type that out and write that down. So really, if the ultimate goal is to capture your voice and to stay true to yourself, there's really no better way to achieve that than to just capture your voice from the beginning. The other thing too to keep in mind when you're trying to decide what to write about is to consider small moments. So a lot of times students feel like their college essay needs to be about their entire life story. Like what has happened in the past 17 or 18 years? That is not the case. Sometimes really small moments can actually have really big impacts. Impacts that affect your confidence, that affect your perspective, that affect your values. I have seen so many students whose essays are so beautiful and so real and just draw you into the story. And truly they're talking about a single moment in time or a single conversation that they've had with someone. So again, try not to think like, oh my gosh, I have to like start with when I was born and what did I do when I was one? And what did I do when I was two and three? That is not the story that you need to tell. So try not to neglect those small moments because a lot of times they can really open up to great college essays. I talked a little bit earlier about this. You want to avoid cliche topics, again, that are about something that anybody could tell. Service trips and sports tend to be kind of those two that students get gone, get drawn to the most. And then we have to take a step back and go, well, wait a minute, you're telling this essay. Couldn't the other 50 people on your football team also write the same essay? Like what is really different about this that's just for you? So keeping that critical eye of how do we really make sure that this is about you, this is a story only you can tell, that's what's really critical. And a lot of times it's those small moments that can reveal those opportunities. Another thing to keep in mind is that the essays are not the place to repeat information that is in the activity section. So when you apply and you fill out your applications, whether it's the UCs, whether it's the Common App, you will have an activity section in which you kind of do the, you know, what you did. So here's an organization where I was a volunteer. This is what I did. This is how I contributed. You don't want to use the essay to repeat that information. What you want to view the essays, or excuse me, the way that you want to view the essays is kind of to give the why behind the what. So the activity section is where you talk about what you did, but then in the essay, you can actually share more about why, right? You can give that personal perspective without repeating information found elsewhere. That's really important. So the essays, that's really your opportunity to explore in an honest way what is your character? How have you been resilient? What are you intellectually curious about? How have you grown? What motivates you? What gets you going, right? Where do you find initiative? And how are you a leader? So view the essays not as a place to repeat, this is what I did in an organization, this is an award that I won, but view the essays as a place to provide deeper insight into information that is not visible anywhere else in the application. I'm gonna do a quick check of the chat because I'm worried my Wi-Fi might be bad because I'm getting some messages. Oh, okay, all right, cool. The messages are about other things, so that's great. I'll, I'll get to those in a second. Okay, how do you know that you're ready to submit? Now, this tip is something I've been giving to students for 20 years. In the current COVID climate, it might be a little bit harder because I used to recommend to students that they would go into a Starbucks or their local coffee shop and approach a stranger and say, you know, excuse me, I'm applying to college. If I buy you a coffee or a croissant or a bagel or something, would you mind reading this essay and then telling me what you think about me? 
right? Literally walking up to a perfect stranger, offering something, you know, small and kind to, to be appreciative of the person's time, but then looking for how does this person respond to you? And let me tell you why I think this is important. Clearly now, if you can't do this in a coffee shop, we'll have to be creative to find other ways to connect with strangers to get insights. But this is why it's important. When you get so into the weeds of writing your college essay, you have to remember that you know the full story. Your parents know the full story. A lot of times your teachers or your friends know the full story. But what can happen is that there can be gaps or places that you have left out that can be confusing to a reader who doesn't know you. So the benefit of giving your essay to a perfect stranger, A, you get to make sure that there aren't any gaps in your story. And B, it's also important because then you can say, well, what do you think about me? What type of person do you think I am after reading this essay? And what is the person's impression? And is that person's impression what you were trying to achieve? So anytime before kind of reading an essay for a student, the conversation is always, well, what was your goal in this essay? Who do you want me to think you are when I'm done reading this? Do you want me to think that you work hard? Do you want me to think that you are compassionate and that you care about animals? Do you want me to think you're smart? Like, what is the goal here? What value are you trying to communicate? So when you can share an essay with a total stranger and kind of get these insights, you can make sure that we don't have any lingering questions. There's nothing you've left out that's potentially confusing. And you can ensure that this person's impression of you is how you want to be perceived. The people reading your college, excuse me, applications don't have any other context about you. They are strangers. So for that reason, I always recommend to students that they take this approach. Also really critical, before you click submit, read the application out loud. That means not in your head, that means out loud. It takes more time to read out loud, but it's really important because if you read out loud and you read slowly, you will be able to catch mistakes that you wouldn't be able to catch if you read in your head. Also important because sometimes spell check is not 100% accurate. Consider if I type something like I considered and agreed instead of and agreed, that's not something that spell check would catch because I didn't misspell anything. But if I take the time to read the application slowly and out loud, I can catch those mistakes. Last tip to make sure before you click submit, did you follow the instructions? There are a lot of times that there's a prompt that has two parts and a student has made the mistake of only answering the first part. So for example, if there's a prompt that asks you to evaluate a significant achievement or experience and its impact on you, students can make a mistake. They spend the whole time talking about an achievement or an experience and they neglect the part about how it impacted them. So make sure that you have followed instructions. Also make sure that you have followed the word limit or the character limit. If you take a 650 word essay that you have in a Google Doc or you have in Word and you copy and paste it into your college application, if that college application kind of field where you copy and paste has a 500 word limit, guess what's gonna happen? The last 150 words of your essay are going to be cut off. So you need to make sure that you are very careful that you have followed the character limit instructions, that you have followed the word limit instructions. The other thing too that I wanna mention just kind of as a concluding note and then we'll, we'll get to your questions. A lot of times what students do, especially if there is a question, you know, tell us about a challenge that you've encountered or tell us about a significant experience. What can happen is students will spend two thirds of the time, or they'll even spend 80% of the time just talking about the challenge that they experienced. And then they just spend a little bit at the end kind of connecting it to themselves and how they grew and, and what that means. You really have to kind of do the opposite. Okay, colleges are not going to accept you because you've endured something difficult. Colleges are going to accept you because you maybe spend two or three sentences describing what was difficult, and then you spend 30 sentences describing you and how you responded. Because again, they wanna learn about you, they don't wanna learn about how you were affected by something. 
So keep in mind, especially right now, especially with that COVID optional essay, how did this affect you? You know, spending the entire time, I don't want to use the word sob story because that's not fair because there are people, of course, enduring really serious things that have affected them in their lives and very serious challenges. And it is okay to talk about those things, but they are not going to accept you because you went through something difficult. They're going to accept you because of how you responded to something difficult. So you have to make sure that in your essay, you're telling the story about you, not about the challenge. So that's also part of following instructions. They want to learn about you. And so you want to make sure that you're really telling them that story. Next thing is I would love to hear um, from those of you on the call, right? We're always looking for feedback about what types of opportunities and webinars should we provide to families. So for example, we had feedback saying, hey, could you do a webinar on a Saturday? Because it would be easier for working parents and also kind of fun. Maybe, you know, you get with your teen, have brunch, do a little webinar about college applications. So that's why we tried to do one um, on a weekend, hoping that that would be easier for some families. So we're always looking to hear from you, looking for ways that we can provide information that will be helpful. So just a couple ideas. And again, if you have any thoughts on these opportunities or if you have other ideas, please feel free to email. The email that you get from Zoom has my personal email in there, so you can always reach out to me directly. Um, I've had some people ask me about proctoring, kind of doing a virtual practice ACT or SAT where everybody joins a Zoom link on mute and then I could be there to proctor for students. Um, maybe doing a, an extra webinar just about the UC applications and the personal insight questions, maybe one about the prompts that are on the Common App, some do's and don'ts for the activity section. Any other ideas, right? I'd love to hear from you. So please feel free to share either by reaching out to me directly or also, of course, through the, through the chat. All right, so now it looks like we have about 15 minutes left. So I'd love to see what questions you have. So let me exit out of this screen share and go to the chat and the Q&A to see what I can do. If something is optional on the app, does that mean I should probably submit it? Will it better my chances? So in general, this is a great question because there is um, an opportunity where if something says, hey, we have an optional 500 word essay on why you want to come to our college, or we have an optional 500 word essay on tell us about the most important activity and what it meant to you. In general, <clears throat> excuse me, with those essays, yes, if something is optional, you still absolutely want to do it. Um, the one place I'd say where that doesn't necessarily apply would be the COVID essay that if you, if there isn't a way that COVID has impacted you, which would be hard to believe because it's really impacted everyone. But if that was true and, and you weren't impacted by COVID, then you would not need to answer that question. But if you are applying to a specific college and that college has an optional extra essay, you should absolutely include it. Um, okay, next question. Can you tell us more about your college knowledge package? How does it work? Sure. Um, so at Winward Academy, we have a, a college knowledge package that has tons of examples of personal statements where I break down the student's essay and highlight what made it compelling, what made it honest, you know, basically what helped the student get admitted, breaking down how to fill out the Common App one section at a time. I do a lot of call outs around the most common mistakes students make when they fill out the Common App. Um, so absolutely, yeah, our college knowledge package is, is really helpful for students to get a big picture uh, understanding of how to put together their applications. Um, what should I and can I properly put in the additional info section? For example, if I didn't have space in the essays to write about an extracurricular experience, can I write about it there? For example, one really big part of extracurriculars is starting a service club and wanting to make sure I can still help out with school and community events in a good environment and to make sure that my peers can have the same since others were also dissatisfied with student government. I want to emphasize more of my solution than the initial problem. Ooh, good job. Since the solution plays a big part in my life. So it sounds like what this student is asking is, can you look to the, you know, additional essays for opportunities to share more about, you know, how you presented a solution to an issue and what that solution means in your life? 
Absolutely. That's a perfect answer, right? If there is a unique story that you can tell about something that was happening at your school, there was a bad experience in student government, the situation wasn't improving, and so this is what you did about it, absolutely you could write an essay about that. And I just wanna echo what you shared because you're exactly on point. Make sure that the part in which you talk about the issue is very small at the top so that really the bulk of the essay can be focused on your solution and what you did and how it's been a part of your life. Um, next question, some colleges and universities are getting away from the SAT and ACT. What are they using to assess future students and how do I feel about it? So you are correct that for this year, so for our current seniors, assuming they've started school in the past few weeks, otherwise rising seniors, the SAT and ACT have been made optional. The idea is in the past, if I applied to UCLA, if I didn't have an ACT score or SAT score on my app, immediately rejected. Now, if I don't have a score, I can at least still apply. Right now, the situation is that for future classes, so current juniors, current sophomores, current freshmen, those ACT, SAT requirements are planned to be coming back. That being said, we're going to have to happen, or excuse me, have to see what happens. What's going to happen this fall with exams? What's going to happen next spring with exams? I would have to assume that hopefully if by spring, which is when most juniors are taking their um, uh, ACT and SAT, if the tests are being administered, no issues, then it would make sense for the colleges to say, okay, you were able to take this, uh, we want your scores. So unfortunately, we won't know until we see, you know, fingers and toes crossed that everything can get back to, you know, being in a nor more normal rhythm for everybody. Um, but we will have to see what happens. But right now, it would be important for current juniors and sophomores and freshmen to be thinking about how they would plan ahead for those exams, which remember preparing for those exams is really just remembering math equations that you've learned since middle school, learning grammar rules and being a strong reader. So the skills that you're building as you're preparing for those exams are really important for you forever, right? Not just for the ACT or SAT. Okay, next question. Uh, how do you suggest students understand how to see their unobvious positives? Some kids don't have leadership positions or sports stories and they can't understand how to find a catchy personal tidbit. Sometimes students feel like they have to be worthy. So that kind of gets back to the idea of what are just things that you do that are quirky, that matter to you, maybe a hobby that just is something that's special to a student. I understand the question because so many students feel like, oh my gosh, I have to cure cancer or I'm not going to get into college or I have to create a nonprofit and, you know, save the whole city in Africa or I'm not going to get accepted to college, right? People have these, these big picture pressures that they put on themselves, worried that if they don't achieve them by the time they're 17 years old, that they're not going to have a shot. That is not the case, right? What colleges are looking for are students who are bright, who are hardworking, who are going to contribute, who are gonna be eager to learn, eager to grow, because ultimately they want you know, great alums who are gonna be proud of the university, who are going to donate to the university, right? That's really what colleges deep down are looking for. They wanna make sure that they're building those relationships with their students who are coming so that they'll continue to be a part of the university and the university's growth on a longer term basis. So I definitely would say um, for your student, you know, try to take off that pressure of, oh my gosh, I have to do this huge thing to be worthy to get in. That is definitely not the case. The student should just demonstrate that he or she has contributed, has grown, has learned something funny that's happened, something meaningful that's happened. Again, those experiences can really be powerful at revealing who a student is. Uh, can you share your thoughts on whether my child should submit test scores? Um, so kind of the, the general thought here is if you have a rising senior who has taken the ACT or SAT, so perhaps took it before the cancellation started in March, and that student likes the score and the score is strong, absolutely you should submit it. No reason to hide even if it's optional, right? If you did well on something, you want to include it. The challenge now is that so many parents are concerned, is this something I should still have my students studying for and preparing for, you know, to take these exams in the fall. So what I would say there is, 
if you've done a lot of work, if you feel really confident about the tests and you have an opportunity to take them this fall, then you absolutely should because it won't hurt you to have great scores. If you live in a city where you would have to drive seven hours or if you would have to fly across state lines to be able to access a testing site to take it, I think that's where you need to be, you know, genuine and, and honest as a family about whether it's really worth it to take on that financial burden or that personal burden, if it's something where your student might not even score really high, right? So kind of what's happening right now is that students who are in a position to have really strong scores will likely submit them. Students who are in a position where either they can't access it or maybe they were concerned that they weren't gonna score really high, they're just gonna kind of have a more lucky situation that they can apply and not have them be required. And then hopefully other parts of their application will be considered more completely. Um, next question, can you advise the timeline to develop an essay? I recalled investing time during summer before seniors start. Yes, so if anybody on this call is a current senior or a parent of a senior, you need to get going ASAP on the essays. Um, if you are applying with the earliest deadline, that would be November 1st, if you're applying early decision or early action. If you're applying to the UC schools or to the CSUs, that's a rolling thing from November 1st to November 30th. You don't want to be the person submitting November 30th at 1159 PM, but really kind of by mid to late November. Regular applications are pretty much due in kind of the January timeframe, but in general, to make sure that you would be ready if you are applying early anywhere, you know, November 1st is going to be here before we know it. So you definitely want to make sure that you're getting going. If anyone on the call is a junior or sophomore, kind of a younger student, and you're thinking, how will I best plan ahead, then the person answering this question is exactly right. The summer before senior year is a great time to put in, to start to do research on colleges, to start to figure out what are your values and what do you want to write about. So definitely kind of the summer before senior year is a great time to start the essays. <clears throat> Next question, are there cases where submitting an SAT score would hurt us more than just not submitting it? So I actually had a call with a mom this week who was talking about how her daughter took the SAT at the end of sophomore year and then was planning to take it again as a junior and was kind of concerned like, what if she can't retake it? Should we still send in the score from sophomore year? <clears throat> so we talked about it and even though the score wasn't as strong as what the student would have ultimately wanted when she applied, I did recommend to the family that the daughter submit her score, and this is why. The fact that she was taking it at the end of sophomore year, and she still did really well, by the way, um, the fact that she took it at that time shows to the admissions committee, right, this is a student who is committed, who is dedicated, who is, you know, trying to get ahead of these types of things, so it sends a good message. Also for a student score at the end of sophomore year, she can share, you know, this was my score at the end of sophomore year. I was planning to retake it as a junior. Since I wasn't able to do that, please just consider that, you know, in the time during my junior year, I would have improved my score. So again, just kind of talking to the admissions people like their people because they are and just being very open about you know this is what i did and and this is what i was hoping to be able to share with you that i could have retaken it um, but i wasn't able to so please just consider um, that you know this is this is the score that i have um, okay next question and i do realize that we're we're out of time and i still have another 30 17 in the q a plus 30 in, or 28 in the chat um, I will continue to stay on and, and answer questions because I don't want to feel like I've left anybody hanging. Um, but please do feel free if you need to hop off to, to hop off and we will um, send a link after to YouTube. So if you wanted to kind of watch just the last segment at a later time, uh, please feel free to do that. Okay, next question. Um, what else can you include in the additional information section? Can I include a short essay and the other stuff as well? So um, on the common application, I should have made this more clear. There's that 650 word main prompt that everybody has to do. There's that extra optional 250 word COVID related one that's brand new this year. Then the common app also has a 650 word essay. Is there anything else you want us to know? So that's an opportunity kind of to the question asked earlier by someone about, you know, is this where maybe I should share more about an experience that I went through and what it meant to me to be a part of the solution. 
yes, you could write about that in the additional information. You could also, in the additional information section, just kind of think big picture, like step back, look at your application. What does the person know about me from my activities? What does the person know about me from my main essay? And then what's missing? What's another part of who I am? What's another story that I can tell to fill in some of those gaps? So in terms of what else should you include in that additional information section, the answer is you should include whatever will tell your complete story. And the only way you're going to figure that out, and again, it's hard because you get sucked into the weeds on this, but if you can take a step back and look at your application very objectively, what am I learning about myself, you know, from this part and this part and this part, what's missing? The other thing that you should ask yourself is what would a college be concerned about? Because if there's anything on your application that you think someone would look at and go, ooh, I wonder what happened here, you have to explain that. So if you have, a, you know, a drop in your activities that happen in freshman year, sophomore year, right, prior to COVID, because they will understand once COVID hits why activities decline. But if something happened prior to that, or if there's a grade that you think they're going to be really concerned about, or if you had to change schools, or like if there's something that they're going to look at your application and go, huh. I wonder why that happened. Don't let a question linger. You have to make, excuse me, you have to make sure that you can address it. Okay, um, if a school makes optional for SAT, ACT, and if we do have a score but it's not a perfect score, what is the advice to submit or not submit? So for example, based on the school's average score requirements in the past, yes, I think you're exactly right. So what you should do is look at the college to which you're applying, Look at the average scores for the past students they've submitted. If you're on track with the average, really close to it or above average, then you should absolutely submit your score. If you're significantly below the average, then I would say probably for this year, just don't submit a test score because I wouldn't want, again, if there's a huge gap, if you're just a tiny bit below the average, this does not apply. But if you're significantly below the average and you're concerned that um, you know, you're not going to look as competitive, then I would recommend not submitting your scores. But if they're on track with the average acceptance um, or above, then absolutely you should. Next question, do I consult students individually? Um, so I have been doing that for the past 20 years, working with students on their essays and their applications. Um, with everything with Windward Academy and most of the travel that I've had to do the past few years kind of during the, the fall to, to get school started and to train principals and do workshops for students, I haven't been um, taking more students personally. Um, with the current COVID situation and not having to travel as much, I guess I, I could entertain, you know, maybe taking one or two students, um, but I would just have to be careful that I'm not over committed. So if it's something that you would be interested in connecting with me about, please do feel free to email. Um, how much does your college package cost? So the college knowledge program that we uh, provide, the one I talked about earlier that has tons of examples of personal statements, step-by-step -step how to fill out the Common App, is uh, $499.99. So it's about $500 and um, you can access it through uh, Windward Academy. Next question, would a 1480, we have lots of ACT, SAT questions. So would a 1480, that's an SAT score, be considered too low for IVs? No, I do not think that that's too low for IVs. I think if you have a 1480, especially if you took that prior to all of the cancellations, that means that you took it early in junior year, which means that you did really well. So I would absolutely submit your 1480. Um, and then it looks like this person is also sharing that his or her grades and AP scores are also really strong. Um, oh my gosh, taking 20 AP exams by the end of senior year, you're going to win the College Board AP uh, award for the most AP tests. So yes, absolutely submit your 1480 and you should be very proud of your 1480 because that means that you did really well. Uh, will this presentation be sent out or on the website? I missed the first seven minutes. Yes, we do. We are recording and we will post it on YouTube and then I will send a link to everybody who registered with that link. Um, next question, uh, do your various college admissions packages include one-on-one -on -one help with essays? Um, so the package that's available online does not include one-on-one -on -one support. So those, that's the one with all the examples and the step-by-step -step guide. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one support would be something that you could email me about. And again, I'll have to, to be careful because I don't want to overcommit 
Um, but it would be something that I'd be happy to talk to a few families about if you were interested. Um, another idea for a webinar. How about arranging a webinar where students who don't know each other, since we have a global cohort, read their essays to each other and get reactions like you mentioned? Okay, I love this idea and what is so perfect is in the moment that I was talking about how are we going to find strangers, in the back of my head I had this thought of, wow, maybe we should have a webinar, we should find a way to connect students. Um, I love this, yes. What we'll probably have to do is just find a way to make sure that we can get parental permission because we'll have to you know, be careful about having people who are underage kind of opening up and sharing things to each other. But I do think that this is a great idea and we will absolutely look into it and make sure that we can protect students and their privacy in the process. Um, recording and playing back guidance is in the context of a prompt. Um, I don't know if I understand the question, but I think that what you're asking is the advice that I gave about how to, you know, just record yourself talking about things that matter to you, about challenges you've encountered, about activities that you've done. Yes, that is in the context of a prompt if you want to, or you can just sit down like you're having coffee or tea with a friend and just start talking. Just start talking about things that you care about, things that you like, things that you don't like, things that you're passionate about, things that make you really intellectually curious. Like what do you do when you just lose track of time? Will you just get so sucked into something, and it, not video games or movies, by the way, but like something that's stimulating your mind that you just get really absorbed in? Those are really great topics to then write about because clearly they really matter to you on a very real level. Next question, should my daughter use the additional information section to drive home the point that one activity took up so much of her time that she didn't have time for other activities or will the hours spent per week and weeks per year entered speak to that? Great question. So it does happen that sometimes students have one activity that can take 20 hours a week for them or 25 hours a week, something that's really significant that involves a lot of driving, a lot of time. So that will be captured in the activity section because you'll be able to say this is how many weeks per year I do this, this is how many hours per week. So the colleges will see that and will understand that if you don't have all 10 activities, it's likely because there was one or two or there were one or two that kind of took up a lot of your time. Something that your daughter could do is maybe share what other things she wished that she had more time to explore. So maybe something about, you know, this, while I was wholly committed to this activity and, you know, because of the time commitment, I wasn't able to take on other tasks. If I had had more time, these are some things that I would have enjoyed doing. How have I pursued those when I could during the summer or during, um, you know, holiday breaks when I didn't have as much time, you know, constraints with school. This is how I still pursued these other things. And while I wish that I would have had more time, any opportunities that I did have time, this is what I was doing. So I think that that would be a great idea for your daughter. Um, okay, now to the chat where we have 35 messages in here. Let me see. Um, okay, we have the messages about my Wi-Fi. Thank you again so much. Uh, will we be sharing the slides? Yes, I'm happy to share the slides and we'll also be posting the webinar. Um, how soon should the students start on the essay? This is something that, again, if you are, you know, kind of current juniors or sophomores, you don't really have to worry about this a lot right now because it's something that you'll really start working on in the summer before senior year. That being said, I do have advice for younger students. If you're doing something or if you do an activity and something really special or really meaningful happens that is just like affects you in a different way, just get a little journal or start a Google Drive, even if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, and just kind of take note of what happened and what it meant to you and almost like a little journal log for yourself of activities and experiences that have been impactful. Because then, you know, kind of towards the end of your junior year or beginning of um, your rising senior summer, you can look back at that document and it might be a great place to reference, you know, what were some of these really meaningful small moments, and then you could choose to write about those. Um, looks like some people definitely want activity section, do's and don'ts, a webinar um, about college essays. Looks like some people like the ideas for future webinars, which sounds great. Do's and don'ts of the resumes and the applications. I could definitely do that. 
Sorry, I'm just kind of scrolling through here. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, oh, I have a very nice thank you message. You're welcome, Mr. Hada. Thanks for joining us. Um, links to the recording. Um, oh, okay, this is an important question. It hasn't come up yet. And it's remiss of me because I should have mentioned it. So the question is, do I have thoughts about the importance of test scores as they relate to merit scholarships? So while a lot of the colleges have made ACT and SAT scores optional to apply, a lot of times the athletic department, so people who are looking for athletic scholarships, and then a lot of the scholarship opportunities for merit are still requiring test scores. So if you are in a situation, and again, it's different at every college, so this is not global advice, so you would have to do some individual research. But if you are applying to a college that still requires an ACT or SAT score to then determine extra financial support that you can get or to determine if you can be accepted to play sports with the university, then you definitely need to identify that so that if you do need scores, these colleges might even say we need a score just so we can document it, even if you take it in February, even if you take it in March, like even if you take it after the admissions deadline, there are still colleges asking for that. So you will need to um, make those connections with the individual schools if that applies to you. Um, should I put every single club I've, oh, sorry, I skipped one. How do you help your student if they're stuck or paralyzed in finding an essay topic? So that question is one I hoped that I could have addressed, but maybe I didn't um, go into enough detail. So that idea of kind of what do I write about, that's where I really encourage students to do that exercise of sitting down with a friend or sitting down with someone they're comfortable with or even the pet, right? Record yourself talking. What do you care about? What are challenges that you've been through? Just kind of start to open up, which I know is not easy for anyone, especially for teenagers. But if you can kind of start to do that, then it can help you identify what are really good topics that you can write about that are things that are genuine and about which you really care. Uh, should I put every single club I've participated in or only certain ones? In terms of kind of highlighting what activities that you've done, if you did something once for two hours, that's again, really not something to celebrate. But if you've participated in multiple organizations where you're doing things on a weekly basis or a bi-monthly basis where they're gen these are genuine commitments for you, then you definitely wanna share those. You don't wanna have 10 activities that you list where you did each one once for two hours or maybe for a Saturday. But if you have several activities to which you commit where they are genuine and they have been throughout your high school experience, then you definitely want to include those. If you were involved in undergraduate research as a high school student, do colleges look at this favorably, especially if you plan to do research at the college that you're applying to? Yes, yes, yes. If you were in high school and you were involved in research at an undergraduate institution, that is exceptional. You should absolutely write about that. And if you're applying to colleges that give you the opportunity to have additional letters of recommendation, you should absolutely ask the PI, the principal investigator from that lab where you contributed to write you a letter. Keep in mind that probably a graduate student, a level person who worked with you would write the letter, but then make sure that it's signed by the main principal investigator. That will really help you when you apply to colleges because colleges love research. It's critically important um, to universities to be world-class research institutions. So if you have that experience, you should definitely talk about it and definitely see that if you feel like you did a great job and could get a great letter, that you have that as well. Okay, let's see. Lots of stuff about posting the webinar. Um, let's see. Will AP scores in COVID be relevant? This is a great question as well. So when you apply to colleges, actually, you're not required to, they, they have a section in which you can list your AP scores, but you don't have to do that. Like you don't have to send an official report that verifies your AP scores when you apply. AP scores are mostly used when you're getting placed at a university for you to earn college credit and then to pass out of classes. So if you took AP exams throughout high school, even if you took them during COVID, yes, they would still be relevant. So the student is asking, is a five still significant? 
Absolutely. If you took the test and you got a five, you would definitely want to include that on your college application. Again, you don't have to list your AP um, scores if you're concerned that, you know, the scores don't reflect your true abilities. But if you did well and you passed the exams or you did, you know, performed well, you would want to include that on your college apps. Also keep in mind too that on the college applications when you're listing your um, testing history and your APs, you should also list the ones that you plan to take in the fall of 2021. So when you're, you know, you say, you know, AP microeconomics, and then there's a drop down menu where you either put the score or you just say that it's planned and that you're going to take it. So you can put your AP scores for ones where you actually have a, a score and then you can also put the ones that are planned. Please do not think that the COVID world has made your five on an AP not significant. It is absolutely still significant. And because you were given that score by College Board, yes, you should include it and you should be proud of it. Um, okay, next question is about what about if you've been diagnosed with a learning disability, how does that influence college applications? So if that is the case for you, it is up to you if that's something that you want to share. Once you start in a university and have been admitted to a university, any documentation that you have about receiving extended time or anything that's related to anxiety or ADHD or anything like that, will be documented with a learning center, you will receive the accommodations that are guaranteed to you by law to make sure that you have every opportunity to be successful. So first of all, you should know that no matter what college you go to, those systems are in place to make sure that you get accommodations that you deserve. Then comes the college application process because it's something that you can choose to share with the universities or it's something that you don't need to share if you don't want to share it. So it's really up to you and kind of how you would shape this story and what the message is that they would get that you should kind of think about before you determine if it's something that you want to include. But you can include it absolutely if it's something that's been impactful, if it's something that you can write a story about in a way that shows that you've matured, that you've grown, what you've learned about yourself, how you have figured out how to work with your anxiety or how to work with your ADHD to be a good learner and to do well in school and kind of what have you learned about yourself and what you need to do. You can absolutely share that. If you feel like the story isn't going to be compelling or isn't going to have that depth, then you can just choose not to write about that topic and the colleges don't need to know if you have ADHD. They don't need to know if you have a learning disability unless you're choosing to share that. Uh, a someone is asking with a student who is a junior, is there anything she should do to make the colleges see the best version of herself? Yes, absolutely. So what she should do is, you know, do well in school, make sure that she's finding opportunities to pursue hobbies or to pursue passions that are really meaningful to her so that as she is applying to college, she can share stories about, hey, this is something I thought I would love. I pursued it. I learned that I don't love it that's okay, that's a great story. Or, hey, this is something I thought I would love. I pursued it and I loved it. And this is what I learned about myself and this is how I see my future, right? So just exploring those opportunities will then give you those options for things that you can talk about. Next question, what if I did activities like swim team in freshman year or debate team freshman, sophomore year, but there are things that you dropped? So on the Common App, you have 10 activities that you can share. Um, I would say that, you know, oh, the other thing too I should mention is that the Common App asks you to rank them in order based on how important they are to you. So let's say you have an activity that you only did freshman year or you only did freshman, sophomore year. If during those times they took a lot of time, they were serious, involved commitments for you, then you should share them. But what will happen is when you rank your activities in order based on how important they are to you, those will just be at the bottom. Does the Common App require one 650 word essay or two? So the Common App has one required 650 word essay. There is an optional 650 word essay. Is there anything else you want us to know? And then there is also an optional 250 word essay that's specifically related to COVID if you want to share how COVID has impacted you. Next question, should we attach a resume and again, I'm sorry that I'm going over so much, but thanks for, for bearing with me. Should we attach a resume if all the information in the resume is already included in other sections of the Common App? 
No, you should not. So some colleges do say that they're willing to accept a resume if you have one that you want to include. If everything on the resume is captured in the activity section or in the honor section, you do not need to include a resume. You would only want to include a resume if it has new, different information. So great question. Okay, I think we're down to about the last five or so questions. Let's see. Is it bad that two of my most impacting activities begin in junior year? Having, working a job and also owning your own business. Okay, the fact that you're working and that you started your own business, amazing. Definitely include it. Not bad at all that you started them in your junior year, right? Keep in mind too that in your junior years when most students turn 16, which is legally when they can work. So if it's, unless I know you can get work permits and stuff for when you're 15, but um, if you have started working as a junior and you created your own business as a junior, that is amazing. Please don't think that there's anything bad about that at all. And you can definitely share about your experience owning your own business. Uh, can I do a webinar about letters of recommendation? That's another great idea. Thank you for sharing. Uh, let's see, a, a thank you message. Absolutely, you're welcome. Thank you for your appreciation. Next question, should I submit a score of a three on an AP? So what I would check for that is again, um, check if the college to which you're applying will accept the score of a three. So some schools will accept threes because that counts as passing on the APs and you will receive college credit. There are some colleges that tend to be a little bit more academically rigorous and they'll only accept college credit if you get a four or sometimes even they require a five on the AP to give you college credit. So if you're applying to a college that will give you credit with a three, then absolutely you should include it. I think that if you're applying somewhere that is a bit more competitive and they wouldn't give you credit for it, then maybe just share your AP scores uh, that they would know that then you would receive credit for those. How important is the activity section? If you do sports but were injured, can you find activities outside of school? So the activity section is really important. A very common mistake that students make is they kind of race over the activity section thinking that they're just going to kind of rush it and focus on the essay. Don't do that. The activity section is a great place to be able to showcase your growing responsibilities, how you've contributed in a unique way. Do not skimp on the activity section. So definitely make sure that you are developing your ideas and your descriptions there. And then if you do sports but were injured, then in the description for the activity, you can include, you know, this is kind of what you did. And then you can put a note that says, you know, in May of 2019, I tore my ACL and needed six months for surgery and recovery or something like that. Like you can put that in there so at least they know if they see that the activity declined because you were injured. Okay, next question. We have three more, and then I'll, I'll probably cut it off so that we can uh, finish up here by 1130. Uh, I was involved with a psychology club and really did participate starting February of my junior year, coming once a week and going to all the events. And then in March, COVID happened and I had to stop, but I would have continued. Can I still write about it? So if you had an experience that again, was really impactful to you, even if it was, you know, cut short because of COVID, what I would recommend that you do is you can write about that experience and what it meant to you. And then maybe what you can share is kind of once you had to stop meeting weekly and you had to stop doing events, what did you do instead to still pursue your interest in psychology? So did you start to watch, you know, YouTube videos or, you know, professors lectures that are on websites? Did you start to read medical journals or read research articles that are related to topics that you discussed? So I just want to make sure that you don't end the story in March with COVID. You can introduce that this is something that you started to do and then share this is how you continue to learn and continue to pursue it once you weren't able to go to the meetings or the events. Um, okay, will schools understand that since March with everything closed, it's hard to be involved in activities? Absolutely. The admissions officers will understand that. You do not need to feel like you have to over explain this is why my life stopped in March. Everybody's life stopped in March. So definitely the college admissions officers will be understanding. They will be compassionate about that. So kind of back to the prior question, one thing that I would extend there is if you had an activity that was really important to you that did had to end or that was, you know, kind of forced to stop, 
what did you do to continue to pursue ideas in that same area or to continue to refine your skills, right? The, even though kind of the world stopped and we all had to be home, what were things that you were doing with your time to still keep you involved or still keep you connected to those activities? Because even though it may not have been in person, hopefully there were still things that you were able to do to continue to learn and, and continue to grow in those areas. All right, last question. Oh, it's a thank you message. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to hear that it was helpful. Of course, I'm happy to go over time um, if that means that we can address some of your doubts and your concerns and your worries. So again, thank you so much to all of you. There are a lot of you still with me here um, almost an hour and a half later. So again, thank you for joining. We will absorb all of your ideas for other opportunities for webinars and please just check your email and, and we'll be in touch about those future opportunities. So enjoy the rest of your Saturday and your weekends and thank you again for joining us. Take care everybody.